Hello, my name is Hwan San Sunim, and this is Sun Meditation in English. So, are we ready to meditate? Great. Uh, the topic for today's uh, contemplation and meditation is the life of Sun Master Chun Gang, who was the teacher of, of my teacher, Sun Master Song Dam. Now, today's program is actually the second part of a special two part program uh, devoted to. Uh, to, to showing uh, how Sun Master Chang Gang lived and what his life can mean for, for us who live here now. Uh, and, and maybe I should briefly summarize uh, what we talked about last week in our previous episode for those of you who weren't here for it. Uh, Sun Master Chang Gang was born in 1898. And when he was very young, he lost both of his parents, uh, which was a terrible blow to him. And he was, uh, he was put into the care of some very neglectful and abusive relatives uh, so that he found that he, would have to, that he had to leave home at a very early age. And after wandering around uh, through, through his native province of uh, South Chalado province, uh, he ultimately ended up uh, ordaining at Hainsa Buddhist Monastery. And at Hainsa, uh, he, was, he was being educated and he was living in a stable community for the first time. But unfortunately, he was forced to witness the very grisly and tragic death of a close friend, which really uh, provided an incredible spiritual shock to him and inspired him to begin meditation and pursue enlightenment. So uh, with all the ardor of his, of his youth and all the urgency of a full-blown spiritual crisis, he went into intensive practice without really, know how, without really knowing how to meditate. And uh, fortunately for him, he did manage to get enlightened by the age, the astonishing age of 23. But he also made himself very, very sick. He, um, he, he had a case of what's called in Korean sangi, which means elevated chi, elevated life energy. It's, that's an overaccumulation of energy in his head that caused him to, to bleed horrendously from both his nose and his mouth and actually threatened his life in the course of his practice. But fortunately, he survived. And, uh, and today's program, in today's program, uh, I'll, I'll go on to tell you what happens next and, and, and what we can, you know, how we can understand his life uh, that, take, that took place in such a different time and place. But for now, why don't we begin our guided meditation? So please assume meditation posture. Jen. Okay, and we will begin with preparation breathing. In preparation breathing, we breathe in through the nose, completely fill our chest, hold, and then breathe out through the mouth. So together then, breathe in. Hold. Then breathe out. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. Once again, breathe in, hold, and then breathe out. And now we engage abdominal breathing. In abdominal breathing, we only breathe through the nose. We breathe in, and as we breathe in, we extend our lower belly. Then we hold for two to three seconds, and then we exhale for a little longer time through our nose and draw in our lower belly. So why don't we try that together? Breathe in through the nose. Hold. Then exhale. Breathe in. Hold. Then exhale. Breathe in. Hold, then exhale. And as our bodies and minds relax and center themselves, we can now begin the Hwadu, the question that we ask of ourselves in meditation. And as we recall in Korean, we do it in Korean, and in Korean it's i mo ko. In English that's spelled Y-I, which means this. M-W-O-T, mo, which means what and uh, G-O, uh, Ko, 
which means is. So in translation, what is this? What is this that directs my body? When I feel an emotion, what is it within me that feels that emotion? When I think a thought, what is it within me that's generating that thought? When I see an image in my mind, what is it that sees the image? When I hear my name being called, what is it that reacts to the sound of my name? The question in English is, what is this? But in, uh, in accordance with uh, traditional Korean Buddhism, we ask it of ourselves in Korean. So once again, and we do this question in coordination with our breathing. So we, as we do abdominal breathing, we breathe in, pause, and then as we exhale, along with our exhalation, go, And we let that last syllable, go, trail all the way to the end of our breath. We want to ask this question as if it's, this, as if it's one with our breath. And we want, to add, we want to physically experience this question as if it's coming up from our dantian, our lower belly. And in our minds, we want to ask this question, i moko, what is this, with the mind of so-called doubt, spiritual doubt, a state of complete, urgent, sincere questioning. What is this? What am I? When I say I, what is this that the I refers to? This is how traditional Korean sun meditation is done. So once again, we breathe in. Hold. And then breathe out. So once again, I ask all of our studio, studio audience members to continue to meditate, to do this abdominal breathing and the imoko in your mind in the course of, of, uh, of my instruction and, and lecture. And also I ask all of you viewers at home to continue to meditate as, as you hear, as you continue to hear the story of Sun Master Jungang in the second part of the special two-part program devoted to his life. So inhale, hold, and then exhale. So Jungang Sinim was 23 when he, when he attained enlightenment. He was still very sick. And what he did afterward was uh, he went out on the road again and he tried to treat his illness, his sanggi. And as he did that, he began to visit the most renowned, the most illustrious spiritual masters, sun masters of his time. And he met with each one of them and engaged, with them, engaged them in a so-called sun question and answer or Dharma dialogue, in which, uh, the, in this case, the two masters, or the masters will ask each other the various kongans of the Sun Buddhist tradition. Now, I've mentioned this on this program before, that in the Sun Buddhist canon, there are 1,700 uh, kongans that are officially recognized. And these are used as an object of meditation for, for unenlightened people like us, and, and, and we become enlightened to them. And for masters, these koans are used uh, to, to test each other, to plumb the depth of each other's attainment. So when Chenggang Sinim went to meet these masters, they, threw, they, they asked the koans of each other to test each other, to train one another. So uh, he met with them, and he swiftly became very, very famous for, for uh, being uh, one of the greatest masters of his generation. He, he didn't simply, uh, you know, you know, Sun Master Songdam is very proud to say that that when he went and met with these teachers, he didn't he didn't simply give the correct answer. It wasn't like the other the other masters say, oh yeah yeah yeah, you're you're right you're right that's true. He gave an answer so profound and so startling that they just stopped in their tracks and couldn't say anything. He stopped them in their tracks uh, with with totally unexpected, totally creative responses to these traditional questions. And he became most famous for uh, uh, attaining Inga, uh, which is uh, auth official, authentic, uh, official recognition of his enlightenment from the masters. It's called Inga, I-N-K-A. And he received Inga from the six greatest masters of his time. They were sun masters um, Hewar, Hebong, Hanam, Yongsung, Powar, and Mangol. Sun Master Mangong was probably the most famous of them all. He, he's, he's historically noted for having participated in the Korean independence, in the Korean independence movement against Japanese occupation. 
that was happening in the first half of the 20th century. But he went after all of them and, and, uh, and astounded them with his spiritual, uh, his spiritual ability and received Inga from all of them. And actually, the final master, Mangong Sinim, not only gave him Inga, but named him his official Dharma heir, gave him full Dharma transmission. And once again, the astonishing thing about this was that Sun Master Changgang achieved all this before he was 25 years old. That's Asian calculation. By Western reckoning, that means he was only 24. When, when he was recognized as one of the greatest masters of his generation. In modern terms, we would call him a genius, 24 years old. And um, so he, he, after that, uh, he embarked on a very colorful, flamboyant kind of legendary career as a master. Uh, at a very young age, he went to some of the most renowned, respected meditation monasteries in Korea and, and headed them as their leader. Uh, he also traveled around, he continued to travel around, meeting people, meeting other masters, and teaching very many students. Now, in his late middle age, he finally met uh, my teacher, Song Dam Sinim, who was the equivalent of a, of a high school student at the time. And Song Dam Sinim was inspired by, by, this, by this great spiritual genius. And so Song Dam Sinim became a, a, a monk under Changgang Sinim and embarked on his own legendary career. Uh, beginning with his famous 10-year vow of silence, during which time Sun Master Changgang took care of him, protected him. This took them through the Korean War, some of the most dangerous, chaotic periods of Korean history. And, and Changgang seemed to care of him and protected him and guided him through that until at the end of 10 years of silence, Song Dam Sinim was able to attain enlightenment and receive Dharma transmission from Changgang Sinim. So what we need to understand is that Songdam Sinim is the Dharma heir to Changgang Sinim that leads back up through Mangong Sinim. So um, they, they were able to do this, and then in the later part, in the last years of Changgang Sinim's life, he founded my home temple, Yonghwasa, in Incheon. He deliberately founded a temple that was not in the mountains and far away from the city at that time. It's a city now. Uh, he did that because if he went to a beautiful place in the mountains, he thought that it would, it would attract tourists and sightseers and that kind of thing. And he wanted to go to a place where really no one would go except to practice. So Yonghwasa was founded and uh, Changgang Sinim led the Yonghwasa community for about 10 years until he finally passed away in 1975. And then at that time, uh, Songdam Sinim took over and has been leading Yonghwasa since for the past almost 40 years. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I chose to embark on a personal retreat, a personal summer retreat at an ashram in India. Uh, at the time, I was going through, I think, uh, a transitional period, and I was uh, questioning some of my uh, most deeply held assumptions and beliefs about the spiritual path. I wanted some time and space for myself and I wanted to be out of my customary environments, whether it was Korea or the United States. So I chose to go to this, this ashram. It was actually a rather famous ashram in the southern part of India. And, uh, and actually, I went there at the peak of their hot season, at the peak of their, hot, uh, their southern hot season. So the average temperature was actually above our body temperature. And, and I went down there, and I got a room. And, uh, and this ashram had been founded by a very, very famous uh, 20th century uh, Indian spiritual leader. And, and he had passed away several decades before. 
but the community was incredibly faithful and devoted to his teachings, and so the community continued to run as if he was still alive. And the ashram was the center of an, act, of an entire town uh, that was, that was uh, uh, being um, managed according to this spiritual teacher's teachings. So I was very, very impressed by their devotion and their purity, and also by the efficiency which, by which they ran their, their community. They had medical centers and schools and, and all sorts of uh, you know, support services. So it was, it was actually a very wonderful community, and, and, and I was very grateful to be allowed to be a part of it. So I was there, and I, I was meditating, and, uh, and after a while, I, I made friends with an elderly brother and sister. I think they were in their late 50s or early 60s at the time. Uh, their names, the, the, the man's name, the brother's name was Dananje, and his sister's name was Usha. And, and they, were, they were really wonderful people. Uh, Usha didn't speak that much English, but Dananje was, was quite fluent, and he spoke in this kind of very charming, old-world European style of English. Uh, and and, they, and they, they, they had me over as their guest, uh, you know, on the weekends, like once a week, they, they gave me dinner and, and we would talk. And, and in the course of getting to know them uh, through these weekly visits, uh, I, I began to hear about their lives. Now, Dananje and Usha were raised by very, very devout parents. Their father was a very well-known patron and supporter of the native Indian spiritual tradition of wandering yogis and gurus. So their house was, uh, was, you know, was open to these, these yogis and gurus and, and often very famous, uh, some very famous uh, early 20th, centuries, uh, uh, 20th century gurus and yogis would visit their house. And, and just as in Korea, uh, the families would, would, you know, would offer them a meal, uh, which, which the yogis and gurus took, and then afterward, the, the, the spiritual masters would, would give their teachings to the family, spend the night there, and then move on in their sort of endless spiritual wandering. So Dananje and Usha were, were raised to revere spiritual practitioners and spiritual masters. And they, they took a great in, in personal interest in, in, my own, in my own practice, uh, you know, whatever form it took, in India. But uh, as I soon learned, uh, when Dananje was a young man, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was, uh, uh, you know, he was, he was arranged to be married with this woman. You know, back in those days, uh, people married according to arranged marriages. So he was, you know, it was his time, and and he didn't meet his wife until the actual wedding ceremony. But but luckily enough, when they met, they did fall in love with each other, and, and they were tremendously happy with each other. And, and uh, Dananje was, you know, was very well educated and, and he, was, he took a post. He took a very good job as headmaster or principal of, of a high school. And so this beautiful future was unfolding in front of them. Um, they, they were very much in love. They were going to have a family and he had this wonderful career. And it just seemed like everything was in place. And then unfortunately and tragically, his wife died. And, and I don't remember exactly how she died. I, I can't remember whether it was an accident or, or some disease or something. But she did die, and it caused him to fall into the most extreme grief and despair. He fell into a kind of nihilistic void. He quit his job. He became a complete invalid, and, and he couldn't function anymore. And his sister came to live with him and take care of him, and they lived together ever since. So the interesting thing about Dananje was that... that you know, after the death of his wife, he never really had that kind of spiritual faith again. He, he, he himself was, a, 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 was quite adept at yoga as a, as a young person, as a young man, but he didn't really follow up on it. And he retained his interest in the spiritual traditions, but he was no longer interested in participating in it. He just liked to, to observe and, and witness it. So like, as I said, he was interested in what I was doing. And he would always see, say to me, you know, if, if, you ever, if you ever come up with something, if you ever find something, can you tell me about it? And I said, well, you know, you know sure, no problem. You know, if, if, I ever, if I ever come up with something, I'll, I'll let you know. But he himself uh, wasn't, wasn't very interested in it. So I, as I continued along this friendship, I, I was pondering my own, my own personal questions, and I, I decided to sort of upgrade my meditation practice and, and actually, in, in imitation of, of my teacher, Songdam Sinim, who is famous for his 10-year vow of silence, I decided that I also wanted to try silence myself. 
and conduct and conducted the rest of my summer retreat in silence and 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 uh, and tried to meditate as intensely as possible and so um, it, I, I, I was very interested on a personal level on, in terms of what, what one can experience in that kind of silence and, uh, and also curious about what, what Song Damsim had found so compelling about it. So uh, I went into practice and I, I meditated through the day and as I said, it was, it was very, very hot and I, I had to hydrate myself constantly, drinking water all day long and I couldn't really go outside during the day. And so it was only when the, when the sun set in the evening that I would go outside. And this ashram was located on the coast. So after a very short walk, I could go to the beach. And, and you know, at the beach, you would see you know, the vast you know, Indian Ocean and the vast Indian sky. And I would walk along the beach. And when I was walking there, all the, all the Indian children would run to me uh, because they wanted money. They, they were very poor and they, they were begging for money. And I was a foreigner there. So every time I went for a walk, I had to carry a pile of rupees, you know, small change, and I would just hand out money as I go. And then there were the lepers. Uh, leprosy is a treatable disease, I know, but for whatever reason, at that time, more than 15 years ago, the system wasn't addressing. So I saw lepers, uh, you know, it was, it was a very common sight in very advanced stages of the disease. And these lepers would just walk up to me, look me straight in the eye and just hold out their hand. And sometimes fingers were missing from their hand, sometimes an eye was missing, sometimes a nose was missing. They were in advanced states of physical deterioration. They said nothing, I said nothing. I just put the money in their hand, they took the money, they walked away, and I walked away. There was really, there's really nothing you can say you know, in that kind of situation. And this, this was a great kind of... Um, problem that was posed to me because I, I had actually never been exposed to that level of extreme poverty before. You walk out in the streets and I saw people literally in rags, literally in shredded clothing, usually just, you know, shredded shorts, their skin completely exposed to the elements, uh, people, half-naked people lying in the dust in the morning, uh, already drunk from some cheap liquor that they managed to find. And it was just, you know, it was, it was hard to process. Dogs knew to step out of the sunlight into the shade of trees, but these human beings just lay there in the sun, baking uh, completely out of their minds. So it was, a, it was a level of suffering that I had never seen before, or, you know, I'd of course heard of it, but to see it up front, and I, and I was meditating at the time, uh, doing my own, you know, little bit of silence, and I kept thinking, you know, what does it mean to meditate in a world of such extreme suffering? I mean, it, it, to meditate, to pursue one's own enlightenment in the midst of such suffering, is that the most irresponsible thing that you can do? Or, or is it the proper response, as, as the Buddha himself taught? Uh, so this was very much on my mind as, as, the, as the meditation proceeded. And then somewhere along the way, through these evening walks, I, I met this little boy, this beautiful little boy, maybe 10 years old. Um, he was, you know, his, his face was, his eyes were so bright with, intelligent, with intelligence and good cheer and good humor. You know, he was as handsome as a, as a young movie star with this unblemished skin and this shining smile and dimples and just really the most charming boy that you could ever meet. And he, he carried around this bucket, and in this bucket he had this, uh, this kind of bean paste, which I think was called sundar, and he would go around sundar, sundar, and, and he would come up to me. So I, I met him on a pretty regular basis, and, and he was just so intelligent, and so quick, and so funny, and so lively, and, and, and cheerful, and he would take me by the hand and, 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 walk, and, and bring me along on his roots. And then later he introduced me to his mother, who, who made the, this sundar to give to him to, to distribute or, or sell on his roots. So, you know, I met him and, and he thought, you know, because I didn't talk, he thought I was, he probably thought I was kind of mentally deficient. But, um, but, you know, he would look straight into my eyes and there was communication there. And, you know, this lovely, beautiful little boy, you know, that I fell in love with and, and I would look at him and just think, wow, you, you've just really just stolen my foolish heart. 
And, uh, and so, and, and, and that, that's the way it was through the summer, meditate during the day, give money to children and lepers, and then, and then be led around by this little boy. And then, then the, the retreat ended. It was, it was time for me to end my stay at the ashram. And, uh, and so I went, I broke silence and I, I went out on the beach again to go look for the little boy. And I found him and I, and I, I, I talked to him, which he had never seen me do before. So, <laughs> so he was like yeah, looking at me and, um, and I said goodbye to him, which he understood. And he shook my hand and said goodbye. Then he went on his way to sell his, 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 his sundar. And I took my bags and I went to Danan Jain Usha's house. They, they agreed to, to put me up for the last night and then I would, I would take a train out and, and travel in India. So I had dinner with them and, and I told Dananjay the story of the little boy. You know, and, 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 you know, this remarkable little boy. And I said to him, you know, I saw this boy and I thought, you know, I, I, I looked at him and I thought, are you the reincarnation of, of Jangang Sanim? You know, are you the reincarnation of some advanced spiritual master? Has Changang Sanim come back to the Buddha's homeland? That's, that's how striking this boy was to me. And, and I asked Dananjay, you know, you know what, what's going to become of him? And Dananjay looked at me you know, you know, in a very serious and sad way. And he, said, and he said, well, if he's really as smart and good and brave as you say, most likely he'll become a thief or some other kind of criminal. And I, I suspected that, but to, but to hear it was, was so disappointing. And so I, I said to Dananje, I said, you're telling me that he's going to become a thief or a criminal because he's smart and brave. And Dananje said, yes. Uh, if he were unintelligent and weak, most likely he'd end up a beggar. But you're telling me he's smart and brave. So in a little while, he's going to get very angry. And then most likely he will take the route that's available to smart, brave young men, which is to become a thief or a gangster of some kind. So Dananjay saw me getting very dejected. And he, and he said to me in this kind of charming old school way of his, he said to me, he said, I'm afraid that that's still the way of things around here, my friend. And I said, well, uh, I think I understand that. So why don't we take a break here? And uh, when we get back, I will continue uh, this discussion about what the life of Changang Sinim can mean for us. OK, so we will take our break. Sun Master Songdam, in his Dharma speeches, likes to tell the story of the man who visited the underworld. And in this story, a man goes to sleep. And in his dreams, Yama, the Buddhist lord of death, comes to him and tells him that he's going to take him on a trip. And, the, and Yama, the lord of death, takes this man to this great mansion filled with countless rooms. And uh, in, they go into the first room. And in the middle of the first room, there is a giant pot of the most delicious stew bolted to the floor. And there's a group of people sitting in a circle around the pot, bound to their chairs. And their whole, each of them is holding in their hand a very long wooden spoon. The spoon is so long that they're not able to take the soup and fit it into their own mouth. It's longer than their arms. And, and comically enough, these people's faces are covered with bruises and cuts, and they're completely covered in soup. And there's soup all over the floor. Because what's happening is that anytime someone reaches into the stew with a spoon, the others attack <laughs> with their spoon, start hitting them, knocking the soup out of the spoon. So nobody's allowed to eat, and they're, they're all skinny and emaciated and beaten up, and they're all angry and they're upset, and it's, it's, just, it's just a complete mess. So the man looks at Yama, the Lord of Death, and he says, you know, you know, where is this place? Where am I? Where have you taken me? 
And the Lord of death says, this is hell. And the man's like, oh. Then, 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 the, uh, then the man is let out of the room. And they go to the second room. And it's, exact, it's the exact same situation. There's a giant pot of stew bolted to the middle of the floor. There's a ring of people around, around the pot of stew, bound to their chairs, each of them holding a long wooden spoon that's too long for them to use on themselves. But the scene is completely different. In this, in this situation, they're all very healthy and happy and well-fed because what's happening is each person is dipping their spoon into the stew and feeding the person sitting across from them. So they're all busy taking care of each other. And so the man looks at Yama, the, world, the, the Lord of Death, and he says, you know, so what is this place? Where have you taken me now? And, and Yama says, well, this is heaven. And so the man goes, oh. And then he wakes up. And uh, th this is a story that comes out. It's, it's a very charming parable. And I, I think what it means is, I think it's a description of the human condition, the choices we have available to us. I think that the, 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 the soup represents this planet, this beautiful, lush planet that has more than enough for all of us to eat and, and, and go to school and, and be healthy and whatever. And, and the choice is, is up to us. Um, and, and I think this, this story, as simple as it is, as childlike as it is, holds special significance for us now at this time in history, when technology has become so powerful and, and, and our influence on the natural world has become so, so pervasive and so, so destructive that we now, we're, we're now at a crossroads and our, our survival as a species is at stake. And I think this story forces us to ask ourselves a question. Are we really going to tear this planet to shreds and burn it down, fighting each other and pursuing our insane, dark appetites and addictions? Or can we learn through something like meditation to conquer our inner demons and learn to take care of each other? Because taking care of each other is probably the only way we can survive as a species. Human beings don't do well physically and individually alone. We have survived as a species because we learned to communicate and coordinate our efforts to work as a group. This is what, this is what allowed us to live in this world against much more powerful, individually much more powerful predators. So this is all that we have, each other, to live in this world. And I think the story asks us, what choice will we make? You know, to fight with one another or to take care of, of one another. And the reason why I bring up this story is because uh, when I consider again the story of Changgang Sinim, especially this early period of his life, in his childhood and in his young adulthood, when he went from this you know, terrible family circumstances to transcend it all into enlightenment, I'm struck by how alone he was. How few people there were who took care of him or who even took an interest in his fate. Now, I do understand that, that Chan Gang Sinim chose this life for himself. He had renounced the world and he chose a life of voluntary solitude and voluntary poverty. He wanted a life of noble poverty. And he tells us in his Dharma speeches that there were many times when he had come into some money that he could have, he could have you know, lived a, a, you know, an, an economically more feasible life. But at, at each opportunity, he simply gave the money away and, and he embraced poverty as, as his means of practice. This is something that I personally tremendously respect and, and admire. I mean, I'm, I'm totally on board with it and, and I, wish, I wish I were more like that too. But what makes me sad about his story is still, why weren't there people who knew to take care of such a precious spiritual master. He was, he was a treasure, he was a spiritual genius, enlightened at 23, received Dharma transmission at 25. He had a reckless personality, ferocious, and, and he went to the limit on things. There, I wish that there could have been a support system around him to, to protect him against himself, in a sense, and, and, to and to take care of him. And maybe he would have lived longer. Maybe he would have been able to give more to the world if he had a system around him. Um, I think also of that Indian boy, the story of which I just told you. And I think of all those children that I saw in India and, and uh, who came to me. And I, and I kept thinking, isn't there another Changgang Sinim, another Songdam Sinim among these children? 
if we could just take care of them and guide them and teach them? What is being lost by making these children live this way? And so uh, again, the message came to me that, that if we don't take care of each other, then, then, then you know, we're looking literally at, at our own um, destruction. So this is, is one of the lessons. Typically when we talk about masters, we, we, want, to, we want to venerate them. And of course, uh, that, that is the case as well with, with Chang Gang Sin. But I think the story of his great aloneness in his youth tells us what we have to be. It's, it's a reflection of us. As much as his, as his achievement may inspire us, to force that kind of person, such a rare person to live like that, to be forced to live like that, is a reflection on, on us. And I think it, that, that we ought to think about how we treat each other. And in the larger frame of things, looking to the future, uh, there is a large population of meditation monks in Korea who are devoted, just like Chang Gang Sim, just like Song Dam Sim, to attaining enlightenment. Th these people are treasures that we need to take care of more and more within, uh, uh, I think, uh, contemporary Buddhist culture, the emphasis is going away from meditation. And, and that's, you know, that's okay, times change, but to, to forsake them, to abandon them, to make them go through what Chang Gang Sim went through, uh, I think would be a terrible loss to us all because Chang Gang Sim was rare. He could overcome those kind of difficulties. Not all of us can. So meditation monks are not typically easy to get along with. They, they, they can be very reckless and impulsive and very stubborn. They are prey to a very special kind of spiritual vision that pulls them forward. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't make them very reasonable all the time. And we should I, th I think that we should recognize, as Buddhists, we should recognize the gift that's been given to them and learn to understand you know, the, the problems that come along with that gift. So when I look at the life of Chang Gang Sim, I see also an appeal that we very much support the meditative tradition of monks who are dedicated to meditation, as well as, um, obviously, the children who are our future. So I think that's the first lesson. Several years ago, uh, at Yongwasa, we, we have a, on the Buddha's birthday, we now have a tradition where the youth association comes and they perform uh, songs and dance uh, on, on the day of the Buddha's birthday. And, and they, were, they also have a kind of talent contest. And they build this big stage in our parking lot. So several years ago, I, I, I was with uh, Song Dam Sinim. I said, you know, you know, the young people are doing this. Why, why don't we go down and see what they're doing? And he said, all right, that's a good idea. So we went down there, and, and, and the youth association was very, very excited. You know, they, they had heard all these stories about him. Now they were meeting him for the first time. So they all gathered to meet him. And, and, you know, and so uh, Song Dam Sinim sat in the, in the front row of seats, and the youth association members got up on the stage and they sang and danced for him and it was, it was, it was really, really nice. And then they gave him the mic. And uh, so he took the mic and, and I guided him up the stairs onto the stage and he looked out at them and he said to them, he said, you know, Chang Gang Sinim lived his entire life never having enough to eat. He saved up all his money and it wasn't that much money, but he saved up all his money to give to the next generation. And when I look at you now, healthy, well-fed, educated, I see that his dream was realized. And, and I can't tell you what this means to me. And he says, if I have anything to say to you, it is this. And Song Dam Sim was over 80 years old at the time, but he raised his fist over his head and he screamed into the mic, be forever young. And of course, the entire crowd went up in a roar of applause and it was a big deal and it's become kind of a local legend at our temple. This is a theme in Song Dam Sinim's teachings that even though our bodies may age and get sick and die, in our minds we can stay forever young through meditation. Through meditation we can heal our wounds and, and prevent ourselves from being calloused and retain a youthful attitude of hope and faith and courage uh, in the face of, of living life. And he has often said, every day is the day that I first become a monk. And that is why I am still young. And he said this when he was 80 years old. 
There's a saying among Sinims that, that when you become a Sinim, you stay the age that you were when you became the Sinim, on the day of your ordainment. And I, I think there's some truth to it, because uh, when I hear the, uh, the talks of Changgang Sinim, I feel like I always hear that, that sad, mischievous little boy full of pain and fire. And when I, when I look at Songdam Sinim even now, I feel like I see that, that stalwart young man stubbornly intent on renouncing the world. And, and when I look at myself in the mirror, I, I feel like still somewhere inside, there's that romantic 22-year-old kid who was completely blown away by Songdam Sinim's enlightenment. And when I look at all the Sinims that I know around me, the ones who are really still hanging in there and trying to get to enlightenment in the face of all odds, I see the tortured, inspired young men and women that they were and still are, you know, being pulled along by this vision that they don't fully understand. So I, I think that there is a truth to it, that we can stay forever young through meditation if we know how to meditate and if we do it with a very serious level of commitment. So this is the second message uh, that I think we can draw out of uh, this, uh, the story of Changgang Sinim's youth. Uh, the message that I want to convey to you from Songdam Sinim, and that is that we all stay forever young. With this, I will conclude today's talk. Thank you once again, all of you, for attending. Thank you, viewers at home, for attending. This concludes the special two-part program on the life of Changgang Sinim. And in advance, uh, once again, I will close with the traditional Buddhist greeting, and then we will go into our closing session of meditation. So may we all attain the Buddha. And with three strikes of the chukpi, we will enter meditation. Thank you.